Well, good evening. Good evening, everybody. It's a great pleasure to welcome you. My name is, is David Shankland, and I have the privilege of being chair of the society. And um, it's wonderful that that uh, Craig has organised these monthly lectures for us. It's it uh, means that we can both learn a lot and we can stay stay in, in, in contact. Just a, a couple of announcements for members of the society. Our annual general meeting this year will be on the 11th of March, um, but an announcement will be going down shortly. But um, uh, we can, um, <clears throat> of course, hold that virtually, which gives us an opportunity to talk to all of our members, and we look forward to that very much. Also, I should say that the David Blanchard Memorial Fund is going very, very well. For those of you who perhaps don't know about this, um, David Blanchard, one of the greatest Turkish specialists that there's ever been in Britain, um, certainly the greatest living one, I think, um, uh, died very unexpectedly, uh, one of our vice presidents. And so, um, as well as regretting his loss uh, greatly, we've established a memorial fund and the target is £8,000, but we've already um, just about hit £4,000. There's another donation coming in, I know, that will take us up to £4,000 and we can get some tax relief as well on that sum. And so I think that certainly uh, before the end of this year is out, we will have reached our target. And which means that um, firstly, if anybody would like to donate um, uh, to, to this prize, please, 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 please do. And the account details we'll put up on the front of our web pages. In the moment they're not on the front, but if you would like to look now and not wait for us putting them on the front, you can just go to the obituary of David, which is on the front of the web page. And then if you click where it says Remembrance Book, that takes you through to the site uh, describing his life with also a picture of it, with also a recording of his funeral, if anybody's interested. Um, uh, a mass which was held in an Anglican church uh, in his village in Nanmonton in Yorkshire. But then if you click on charity, then our, our details come up because we were the official charity uh, associated with the, with, with, with the funeral. Um, I hope that answers, there we are, that does answer the question. Thank you, Sheeta. So anyway, do feel free to be as generous as you possibly can be, um, because this prize will, will go, um, when it hits £8,000, it will go in perpetuity. And um, um, and it will be, it will mean that every year the society will be able to give an annual prize for the best essay on Turkey from any period. And um, uh, I'm sure it will become a, a famous and prestigious um, uh, accolade to have. And, and one that also means David's memory will, will, will carry on. So thank you very, very much for that. We turn to our, our speaker uh, uh, today uh, now, um, the discourse of disease in Victorian Britain and late um, uh, Ottoman Istanbul. Now, Eric, Eric tells me that um, uh, as well as studying uh, both in Turkey and in Canada and in the US, his, his doctoral topic, I hope you don't mind me mentioning this, is, his doctoral topic is, is also, um, uh, as well as this research, is relations between Turkey and Iran in the 19th century. So. If anybody would like, to, as it were, to veer the questions towards uh, Turkish-Iranian relations, which of course are absolutely uh, a fascinating topic in themselves, then it would be absolutely fine to, to ask our speaker on that topic as well, or, or indeed anything else that comes to your, to your mind uh, associated with his talk. So thank you very much indeed, Eric, for joining us from, from, from Canada. And the, the, the floor is now yours. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, let me just set up here. Okay, well, uh, yeah, firstly, um, I would like to thank Craig and David and the anglo Turkish Society for inviting me to speak today and organizing this whole discussion series and uh, to thank you all for being here. You know, as, as someone who is still in the kind of beginning portions of my doctoral program, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to talk about some of my research and thoughts as part of this series, um, along with so many other scholars in the UK and Turkey and around the world. Um, the topic of my presentation today is sort of, as I said, uh, a little bit adjacent to my broader doctoral project, which is looking more at the influence of hygienic discourse on the relationship between 19th century Ottoman Empire and Qajar Iran. However, in the course of my research, I've also become interested in the way in which disease and epidemics and oftentimes the difference between their potential universality and the actual inequality of harm that they cause allows the historian a kind of unparalleled view into the mentalities and hidden structures of you know, past eras. Um, you know, the, the historian Emmanuel Leroy Ladurie once wrote that epidemics and famines are for the historian what the supernova is for the astronomer. It's like a terrible, violent event, which nevertheless sort of exposes deep 
atomic processes that would otherwise be hidden. And I think the same is true even for anticipated crises, uh, crises which never come to pass. Um, so, you know, in the midst of our own pandemic, our own kind of global crisis, this type of study also reminds us of the impossibility of imagining the historian as someone apart from history and of the kind of ontological equivalence of the historian and their subjects. You know, the historian of disease is potentially no different from the other victims of the disease who are sort of tallied up in an article or monograph. And this fact, which I think we tend to forget in easier times, is really of crucial importance to the ethics of history as a discipline. Um, so last year, I, I gave a presentation for the Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association, which focused on an outbreak of cholera in Istanbul during the autumn of 1871. And far from being a moment of great rupture, the 1871 outbreak produced no great social changes at that time. And aside from occasional brief references, has remained sort of almost entirely absent in the history of the city and the Ottoman Empire more generally. And in this sense, there was something of a historiographic non-event. You know, it didn't kind of durably transform any structures or practices or, you know, to use the kind of definition from uh, Alain Badu, it didn't, you know, clearly open up some kind of new truths. Everyone just kind of confirmed the same truths they already had. And yet, you know, as I said, even the anticipation of a crisis reveals a lot about the hidden tensions in a society. In Istanbul, which had become the, the nexus of an emergent global sanitary system and become the host of a variety of international public health institutions, the threat of crisis exposed numerous ideological fractures among imperial, racial, and class-based lines within the supposedly universal public and public health. And this was particularly evident in the actions of the British residents of the city, who were forced to choose between following the sanitary regulations imposed by Ottoman authorities and supported by a well-respected British physician, or upholding the anti-contagionist notions adamantly maintained by British foreign policy at the time. Um, surprisingly, or maybe not, by and large, they chose the latter with some pretty serious consequences. I'll talk a little bit about the 1871 outbreak in this presentation, but today I also wanna think more broadly about the hierarchies and exclusions, which continue to shape our common understanding of the history of science and medicine, and how the analysis of entangled sites, such as Victorian Britain and Ottoman Istanbul, can lead us to a more holistic and complex understanding of the operation of medical thought. As I argue, <clears throat> it was not only that the Ottoman Empire and Britain were connected by flows of population and trade and disease, marking them as connected sites within the global moment of the cholera pandemics. But it was also that medical discourse was produced between these two empires, with events and debates in one place shaping the development of epidemiology in the other. As I wrote in the abstract for this talk, in the midst of our current pandemic, it's worthwhile thinking beyond the kind of geographic and temporal linearity we are accustomed to when discussing the history of science. And instead of thinking about the importance of global networks of knowledge production in the construction and revision of scientific paradigms. You know, it, indeed, it sort of must be said that the history of 19th century epidemiology, perhaps even more than other disciplines, has been structured by a kind of linear narratives and a kind of unifocal perspective. Uh, although this was the era of the international sanitary conferences, the growth of a vast array of institutions and scientific literature, and the implementation of radical social and structural reforms, we still do tend to popularly understand this history as a succession of progressive discoveries made by singular brilliant scientists. Perhaps because it deals so directly with life and mass death, it's also susceptible to a certain kind of Manichaeism. Those who denied and criticized what we now recognize as the most basic and effective hygienic interventions, like hand washing or the enclosure of sewers, it sort of appear almost like they're aligned with death itself. Whereas it's difficult not to view those who stood against them in the formulation of germ theory, like John Snow, Semmelweis, Pasteur, Koch, as heroes of the highest order. You know, as the scholar, uh, scholar Christopher Hamlin has noted, the history of cholera has both its cult figure in John Snow and its arch-villain in the form of the prominent Bavarian physician, Max von Pettenkofer, who refused to accept microbial theory and the waterborne nature of cholera well into the last decades of the century. 
In his 1984 text, The Pasteurization of France, Bruno Latour criticizes the tendency to focus only on the so-called great men of science like Pasteur, writing that, quote, what the hygienist movement did with Pasteur, it would have done anyway without him. Whilst also exploring why both the 19th century sanitary movement and subsequent historiography find such appeal in the elevation of singular scientific triumphs over the results of broader structural processes and networks of various active forces. Recent history writing on epidemics, I think has largely taken critiques such as this into account and is aimed to understand the development of epidemiology in the 19th century as a more distributed process. Yet this wider focus nevertheless retains a sort of big blind spot. And while accepting that proper science did not have to be done by the genius Pasteur himself, it has sort of continued to expect that science should and could come only from people like him, which is to say, I mean, more or less Western European men. And, you know, texts from the last 15 years, for instance, continue to frame modern epidemiology as fundamentally, quote, a common European endeavor, a product that is claimed of the French Revolution and the increasing political prominence of populations and the rise of demographic and statistical analyses of public health. So in a 2009 history by the eminent epidemiologists Mervyn Susser and Zena Stein, we learn likewise that, you know, the development of Islamic and Chinese medical science, quote, stalled and began to wither with the coming of the European Renaissance, and it will thus be the work of Europe to develop the notions sketched out by these civilizations into proper science. Even Christopher Hamlin's excellent study of cholera recognizes only three types of proper scientific research into the disease during the 19th century. Those by official representatives of European state authorities, those by amateurs in Europe, and those by, quote, exotics, by which he means Europeans in the colonies. And so it's, you know, it's also likely obvious that with rare exceptions, you know, such as Florence Nightingale, those deemed to have contributed to the emergence of this discipline and the fight against epidemic disease were are pretty much mostly men. In essence, the argument seems to go, the whole of humanity suffers from disease, but it was the particular privilege of Western Europe to cure them of it. And to give a particular example of why this is problematic, I would like to first turn to something which is outside the scope of the Victorian period, and somewhat outside of a discipline of epidemiology that's commonly understood, but I believe extremely pertinent to the topic of this presentation and to our current situation. This is the example of smallpox, variolation, or inoculation, and its later development, the practice of vaccination more generally. So the story of the invention of the smallpox vaccine by Edward Jenner in 1796 is famous enough that I won't recount it in detail here, nor to this audience do I like the need to retell the story of Lady Mary Montagu and how she popularized the, pre the precursor of the vaccination, the practice of smallpox virulation in England after her return from the Ottoman lands in 1718. But I think it's worthwhile to examine the beats of this particular story to explore just to what degree the development of you know, what's coded as kind of male Western European medical science is actually really entangled with you know, the sort of female, non-Western, quote unquote, non-scientific practice. And to what degree this is sort of obscured in the history of medicine. In truth, Montague was not the first to detail the Ottoman practice of variolation in English. Four years before she returned to London, two separate physicians published treatises on, uh, sorry, for British audiences, on the efficacy of variolation and the specifics of its technique, drawn from their observations in the Ottoman Empire. These two physicians, Emmanuel Timoni or Timonius and Giacomo Pilarini, were both graduates of the University of Padua, Timoni also had a degree from Oxford, and both were resident doctors attached to British consular offices in the empire, Timoni in Istanbul and Pilarini in Izmir. Both were also ethnic Greeks, although only Timoni himself was an Ottoman subject. In 1714, uh, they each published articles in Philosophical Transactions, the Journal of the Royal Society, with Timonius given an English translation by the physician John Woodward. The scholar Anne Erickson has noted the importance of translation in these texts. Woodward translates and vouches for the veracity of Timoni, who was otherwise, in Erickson's words, quote, a stranger and anomaly and ambivalence, you know, sort of ambiguously belonging to both the European and Ottoman worlds. And Timoni in turn vouches for the strange practice which, to quote, 
this occasions, Georgians and other Asiatics have introduced for about the space of 40 years among the Turks and others at Constantinople. And it's understandable why these multiple chains of authentic authentication were necessary to describe a practice and you know, tr regimen of treatment, which uh, as Michel Foucault correctly noted, were quote, unthinkable in terms of the medical rationality of this time. And you know, attempting to explain why Europe nevertheless gradually came to adopt such a practice on a wide scale, even before the uh, adoption of germ theory and a kind of causal explanation, Foucault argues that variolation was simply, quote, a matter of fact of the most negative empiricism, which is to say that, you know, like the moons of Jupiter as seen by Galileo, variolation just had to be accepted and adopted once observed, whatever the rest of science might say. You know, but to my mind, variolation was not just some sort of natural fact waiting to be discovered. It was a practice and a technique continuously tinkered with and improved by uh, the quote, old woman whom Timoni and Pilarini noted were the experts in performing it. In Pilarini's text, it is an anonymous quote, old Greek woman from whom he learns how to handle the materials, how to make small punctures in muscular tissue with a needle to deliver the smallpox matter and how to care for the patient as they recover from the procedure. In a brief, but very, very good article um, by the medical sociologist Nihan Bozok, she asks why all this is simply considered as a kind of fact to be discovered rather than the workings of medical science in practice. As she argues, quote, what we encounter again is the ideological selectivity of modern medical history in recording information. And this is a selectively designed to kind of exclude the intellectual and physical labor of women and particularly non-Western women as sort of not rational enough or not uh, scientific enough. And already in Timoni's account, we read complaints about these, quote, old women who with no medical training, whatever, encroach on our rights by practicing. Lady Montague's doctor, Charles Maitland, was even more condemnatory of the, quote, clumsiness of these women in his later account. Both Timoni and Maitland changed the procedure to involve the insertion of smallpox material into the veins rather than the muscle and to include intensive regimens of fasting and bleeding before the variolation in order to sort of better match the norms of European surgery. And as Lady Montague would protest, these improvements in fact made the practice vastly more dangerous. As a result, throughout the 18th century, European physicians such as Angelo Gatti or the Southern Sutton brothers would either have to return to Istanbul to relearn the proper technique or else rediscover it themselves through trial and error. In, in doing so as well, these physicians also had to combat the widespread belief that variolation was an irrational product of the Turks, you know, quote, an illiterate and unthinking people whose Muslim fatalism had led them to give into sort of you know, irrational practices. And to be sure, Lady Montague received some credit in the historiography for her bravery in promoting variolation, even in the face of such skepticism. But her efforts still, I think, even tend to be somewhat politely dismissed as premature or as the scholar Hervé Bazin does, quote, not decisive. So it's, you know, it, it becomes the privilege of, again, you know, professional male physicians like uh, Le Condamin and above all Jenner, who as Nihon Bozok writes, get their names written in gold letters in the history of medicine. So you know, Montague, somewhat obscured, and of course the anonymous old Greek woman, totally obscured. And, uh, you know, it sort of reminds me of a, uh, yeah, I'm living in uh, the United States right now. And uh, about two months ago, Ted Cruz, the U.S. Senator from Texas, was attempting, you know, very hard to criticize nations of universal health care by asking, you know, which country was it that developed the coronavirus vaccine? The implication being naturally that only Americans could have done it. You know, and that the vaccine in question had actually been developed by Turkish immigrants in Germany was apparently just totally inconceivable. And, you know, obviously not everyone is as ignorant as the Harvard-educated Ted Cruz, but he represents a, you know, kind of particular contemporary manifestation of one aspect of what the historian Nuket Varlik has termed epidemiological orientalism. In this case, the belief that only a certain sort of subset of humanity is capable of producing genuine scientific knowledge. For Ted Cruz, that would be the free market loving Americans. And for 19th century medical science, that was largely British, French, and German professional physicians. The history of cholera gives us a good example. Though it was an Italian, Filippo Pacini, who first identified the cholera bacterium in 1854, it would not be until Robert Koch presented his own discovery in 1883 
that this achievement would be recognized. Likewise, though the first cholera vaccine was produced by the Spanish physician Jaime Ferran in 1885, his work was largely doubted or outright dismissed. As Christopher Hamlin writes, quote, most could not stomach the idea of an unknown local doctor in a backward nation overthrowing serious science. And it was as a result of such epidemiological orientalism that develops produce, developments produced between the Ottoman Empire and Great Britain, such as vaccination, came to be attributed to European or even British science alone. And the Ottoman scientific discoveries were relegated to tradition or natural fact. There's another sort of more prominent aspect of epidemiological orientalism as defined by Varlick, which is what she terms the, quote, spatial association between the Orient and Oriental populations with disease and deformity and death in the European epidemiological episteme. It was not only that the East did not produce science, but that the East was itself diseased. It was the origin of plague, cholera, and other epidemics, which continuously threatened to break through the boundaries of fortress Europe. As late as 1908, it was still argued by Western physicians that the soil of Turkey itself was, quote, a great source of danger from a sanitary point of view, because as a result of millennia of human habitation, the ground was permeated with filth to a great depth, and the wells often infected with typhoid and other disease germs. The historian Alexander Chase Levinson has written in his recent book on early 19th century uh, Mediterranean quarantine that, quote, the same structures that promoted a sense of shared sanitary integrity at home, I mean, in Europe, also gave a sense of coherence to the threatening Orient outside. To Western observers, it figured as a land of decline in which apparent civilizational descent corresponded with the lingering power of pre-modern epidemics. And so although Ottoman sanitary practices were in fact not so different from those of Europe, down to the imposition of quarantines, the existence of isolation hospitals, and even the usage of the color yellow to mark plague-stricken environments, the ideological construction of Europe and its common endeavor of active, progressive scientific medicine in large part did depend on the contrasting notions of Ottoman decadence and Muslim fatalism, ignorance, and irrationality. So here I'd like to turn to another well-known example, which sort of again highlights the entanglements of British and Ottoman medical practice. This would be the example of Florence Nightingale and the hospital she operated in Uskudar during the Crimean War. Nightingale is of course deservedly famous not only for her reforms and regularization of the practice of nursing, but for her work on statistical and epidemiological analysis. But the image that we're probably most accustomed to thinking of when discussing her is, you know, the image that we see here, the woman holding aloft a lantern in the midst of a kind of unfathomable deprivation. As one recent article puts it, quote, soldiers were sent not, uh, sorry, soldiers were not sent to Skutari to be healed so much as to die. It was, in other rights, quote, a place of horror with only the most rudimentary facilities and with sanitary conditions impossible to imagine. So the sense we get naturally is of a kind of medical labor de profundis. You know, the Uskara Hospital is a kind of oriental hygienic nadir, out of which Nightingale, quote, created order, cleanliness, and hope. And yet the, the Salimia barracks, which we can see in the image here, which was, became the hospital, uh, was not really this kind of like ancient, you know, plague house, right? The original structure was built as part of the, the uh, Nizam al-Jadid reforms of Sultan Salim III, and had been designed, according to Ali Yajolu, as, quote, an orderly alternative to the agitated, sprawling, you know, uh, districts of Istanbul. It was laid out in a regular grid. It was equipped with large open courtyards for ventilation and lighting and a network of underground sewers. Largely destroyed after the collapse of the Nizami Jadid, the structure was almost entirely rebuilt according to the latest European norms by the Armenian court architect Krigor Balian during the subsequent reign of Mahmoud II. As Alison Wharton has noted, the Balians were educated in Paris and their structures were, quote, shaped by the academy and its teaching methods. And so when the English visitor, Charles McFarland, visited the barracks in 1828, uh, he, you know, he declared it, quote, superior to any modern building I've seen in Turkey and was just full of, you know, the intense praise for its purity of design and materials and cleanliness and all these things. And, you know, to be sure the structure was in a state of considerable disrepair by the time that Florence Nightingale arrived in the autumn of 1854. And she would regularly reference 
the kind of disastrous sanitary conditions of the Uskudar hospital during this early period as a sort of yardstick by which to measure the achievements or more often the failures of sanitary reforms in British hospitals. But it is clear from Nightingale's letters that these criticisms were fundamentally directed at the inefficiencies of the British military organization during the war, rather than in some kind of inherent uncleanliness of the Orient or Turkish medical facilities. In February 1855, for example, Nightingale wrote that the Salimia barracks could, with some repairs, be made into, quote, the best hospital in the world, and would later argue after her reforms had been implemented that there were, quote, no buildings in the world with which she, compare, with which she could compare it to. Indeed, the barracks had been supplied to the British army by the Ottoman government with the awareness that it was in a state of general disrepair and with the expectation that in the six months before Nightingale's arrival, the British would renovate the structure. Ultimately, you know, for many reasons, they were unable to accomplish this. And there, that, so that forced repairs to be done later when the hospital was already full of thousands of patients. And in fact, far from a hygienic nadir, the Ottoman hospitals during the war were marked, according to the contemporary observer Charles Bice, by, quote, the total absence of malignant cap diseases, the airiness of the apartments, and cleanliness of the floors, furniture, and bedclothes, the comfortable appearance and conditions of the patients, the number of orderlies, and the manifest abilities of the medical attendants. You know, obviously there were varied conditions, so we shouldn't take this as a general thing, but the point is that in theoretical terms, there is really no difference between the, the, the possibilities of the Turkish hospitals versus the British ones. And to a large extent, Nightingale is working simply to implement in Uskudar what was already standard in other Istanbul hospitals, and which then the industrial disorganization of the British military has sort of left neglected. So for example, the Selimia barracks was equipped with water taps in the privies for ritual ablution, but these were broken off and rendered inoperable early on by soldiers occupying the site. So when Florence Nightingale later wished to institute regular hand washing, she had to rebuild the entire system from scratch, even though it was there originally. Compared with the 18th century Middlesex Hospital, where Nightingale had previously practiced her nursing regimen, the Salimia barracks offered a vastly more conducive ground for experimenting with her theories about hospital sanitation and the natural abilities of the human body to fight disease. This is, of course, notwithstanding the fact that outside the particular conditions of Istanbul during the Crimean War, it was unlikely that Nightingale at that time would have gotten such an opportunity to fully implement her preferred reforms in any other sort of British hospital. In this sense, it's worthwhile to think of her experience in Uskidar as another instance of epidemiological entanglement between the Ottoman Empire and British medicine. And without going all the way into some kind of new materialism, it can be said that it was a fortuitous connection between sight and scientist, rather than an isolated leap of individual genius that made possible the reforms now attributed to Nightingale alone. And it's this point that I'd like to kind of further discuss. Because although Nightingale had already become a somewhat respected figure within Britain before the Crimean War, there can be little doubt that she would have encountered entrenched resistance from the medical establishment if she had first attempted to institute all of her proposals in London or in Calcutta rather than in Istanbul. It was only afterwards, after the particular conditions of Istanbul had allowed her to demonstrate the uh, efficacy of her techniques, which has been disputed, but at the time, apparently, you know, uh, it was quite believed, uh, that she was able to take the opportunity to reform hospital care and sanitary measures in Britain and in the British colonies, particularly in India. And, you know, although nowadays certain aspects of Thomas Kuhn's philosophy of science have become sort of unfashionable, it's nevertheless beneficial to think about how what he terms, quote, normal science produces a sense of veracity not by measuring itself against some objective natural truth, but by conformity to and operating within institutionalized paradigms. Within Britain or colonial India, or for that matter, within France or in colonial Algeria, heavy institutional and ideological pressure restricted the available space for experimentation and innovation. If Florence Nightingale wanted to break from the paradigm of so-called heroic medicine, which largely reigned in 1850s Britain, and explore more natural methods of healing and hospice care, she required a space in which both, theory, both theories had to justify themselves on their own merits. Istanbul, as an environment of inter-imperial competition, was also a zone where scientific theories jostled and were able to be measured against each other. Nightingale, for instance, frequently referenced the sanitary practice of French physicians 
which he observed during her stay in the city as a basis for reforms in Britain. When Nightingale herself, her, sorry, when Nightingale herself became the British medical establishment and used her influence as late as 1884 to criticize, quote, the mental poison of the microbial transmission of cholera, it would be British doctors in these interstitial spaces, like Istanbul, that would in turn resist such institutional pressure and work to test and confirm microbial theory. I'll talk about one such doctor in Istanbul, uh, Edward Dalzell Dixon, in a few moments. Um, but perhaps as a slightly clearer example of the way in which Istanbul opted, operated as a productive interstitial space for the development of epi epidemiological knowledge. Um, an example could be found in a comparison of the first two international sanitary conferences held in Paris in 1851 and 1859 with the third held in Istanbul in 18, 1866 following a disastrous outbreak of cholera there the year before. Um, so, as the scholar Valeska Huber has noted, the initial sanitary conferences were the products of internationalism in its infancy and were dominated by a certain ideological confusion. Although opened in the name of common human struggle against the spread of epidemic disease, the actual conferences were dominated by organizational minutia which increasingly came to reflect Anglo-French rivalry over the command of this new international order. As Huber notes, it was only in the name of what is essentially epidemiological orientalism, that is, of the need of Europe to band together against, quote, Asiatic cholera and the Oriental Plague. It was only because of this that a final convention was eventually adopted after several months of sessions. This convention, however, would only eventually be adopted by France. The second conference in 1859 was, Huber writes, quote, very long and equally unsuccessful. For no country could be seen to give a diplomatic victory to France by adopting an international standard shaped by French contagionist ideology. You know, and in this sense, the color conference sort of appear, appear closer to uh, Feyerabend's notion of scientific method than Kuhn's, you know. It's like science as the continuation of politics by other means. Uh, and this was in part because of the supposed the supposed internationalism of the conferences was itself the rhetorical product of European great power politics. So it was in everyone's interest but the French that these remained inconclusive affairs. The 1866 Constantinople Conference, by contrast, was actually marked by the formation of definite ideological camps, which espoused conflicting notions about the nature of cholera and the efficacy of various techniques to combat it. To be sure, the Eastern powers of the conference, the Ottoman Empire and Iran, were hardly dealt with as equal partners. Fundamentally, the concern of this internationalism was in maintaining a kind of global cordon sanitaire around so-called Fortress Europe to secure it from the influx of Asiatic disease. Nevertheless, in Istanbul, the British-led anti-contagionists and the French-led contagionists actually had to negotiate with other nations of this new sanitary order and to subject their arguments to rigorous critique both scientifically and in terms of political viability. Over the course of the conference, for example, the Ottomans tended to form a political bloc with the other Asiatic powers, that is Iran, Russia, and the British administration in India, in holding cholera to be a largely endemic disease and in blocking sort of ham-fisted attempts by the continental powers to impose harsh quarantine measures on Muslim pilgrims and merchant vessels. The arguments about the non-transmissibility of cholera were of course incorrect, but their critiques nevertheless made the arguments of the contagionists stronger and exposed the logical and practical flaws of their initial proposals. So it's actually at this conference that we see science finally at work. As Christopher Hamlin writes, though the later conferences, quote, lack teeth, they nevertheless encourage substantive debate after decades of relative stalemate and put pressure on con contrarian powers who resisted engaging with the latest research. Likewise, Huber argues that at the 1866 conference, Scientists were finally able to strengthen their position vis-a-vis -vis the diplomatic corps, and indeed the conference resulted in a number of influential reports on the origins, transmissibility, and propagation of cholera that had eluded the earlier summits. So, Ottoman Istanbul, with its multicultural population, burgeoning array of sanitary and medical institutions and publications, and as the object of contestation between European powers, was thus actually a kind of crucial environment for scientific debate. Indeed, the city was, strictly speaking, neither the metropole of a kind of unquestionably sovereign state like Paris or London or New York, but it also was not relegated to the sort of marginal status of a colonial city in the production of bacteriological discourse. Instead, 
Istanbul was an immensely productive site of scientific debate and ideological conflict, in part because the actions of each institution in the city had to actually contend with the interests of others in a constant struggle for legitimacy and political relevance. So as much as certain inhabitants of the city might have wished to direct the response to a sort of epidemic according to the sanitary policies of Algeria or India, and to kind of utilize it as a kind of a means of instituting colonial order, in Istanbul, they were actually dependent upon cooperation with Ottoman authorities and other powerful urban constituencies. And so we're actually forced to deal in good faith in the language of international norms rather than police authority or colonial governance. And this was also true for scientific debates within particular communities as well. So for my last example, I'd like to turn to the subject of my own recent research, which is the 1871 cholera outbreak in Istanbul, and the way in which the appearance of imminent crisis kind of set up a clash between the anti-contagionist position of the British embassy and its ally in the press, the Levant Herald newspaper, and the increasingly determined contagionism of the British embassy's resident physician, Edward Dalzell Dixon. Uh, so here I have a sort of map of uh, the kind of course of the epidemic. And this is actually an image from the American press, actually. But I kind of like it's kind of conflation of Ottoman cholera with British merchant ships, uh, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, so by the 1860s, a particular form of contingent contagionism had become increasingly dominant among the British medical establishment through what was termed zymotic theory. And this argued that epidemic diseases like cholera were indeed spread by a kind of germ or zymote, uh, which was transmissible, but which needed to ferment in filthy soil, water, or putrid air to become pathogenic. Yet the official position of uh, more or less the British administration in India, but also because of that, in many ways, the foreign ministry, was to maintain that non-transmissibility of cholera and its entirely endemic character. The Levant Herald, which began by republishing several articles open to both zymotic and the kind of incipient microbial theory, was soon forced to take a side, and it did this to tragic consequences. Uh, so the Levant Herald, you know, was founded in 1857. It was Istanbul's primary English language newspaper, um, and in 1870, the year before the outbreak, the paper had changed hands from James McCone, its founder, uh, to a gentleman named Edmund Whitaker. Uh, but in any case, both had previously worked as consular officials for the British government. And so consequently, the paper was widely seen as a kind of semi-official press organ of, of the British government in Istanbul. As early as July of 1871, the newspaper had been tracking rumors of cholera spreading throughout Bursa. Uh, although upon receiving reports that the Ottoman government were sending doctors to verify these rumors that, you know, complained about their suitability for a task and, you know, encouraged the commission of European doctors and their stead. Um, yet the paper also reprinted on July 29th a lengthy article, which had appeared anonymously in the Times of London on July 21st. And although kind of replete with uh, the characteristic statements of ep epi uh, sorry, epidemiological orientalism is a mouthful. Uh, as it wrote, you know, quote, in tropical Asia, among a teeming population to whom sanitary precautions are unknown, cholera has a permanent home, and so forth. This article was also kind of a remarkable manifesto for germ theory. As it argued, quote, the germs of cholera are mainly propagated by polluted water. The excreta of patients suffering from the epidemic are allowed to mingle with the common drainage and thence to find their way to some river, which further on its own course furnish the water supply to towns and thus distributes the seeds of the disease. And I concluded that the only destruction, only the destruction of the germs of the disease and the prevention of contamination of the water supply would serve as an effective means to stop the spread of cholera. And you know, this seems very common sense now, but this was actually kind of remarkably bold in 1871 because without any identified or isolated toxin, nor any theory of how or why the disease attacks certain populations and not others, the anonymous writer had in fact arrived at the correct supposition. And you know, to anyone at the time looking for a complete theory of the disease, the hypothesis advanced by the Bavarian uh, physician Pennenkofer, who I mentioned, you know, which is that cholera was produced for the fermentation of filthy soil under particular conditions, actually offered a much more rational and evidence-based theory of the case. And so later the Levant Herald would fully repudiate these earlier articles and argue from this standpoint that it was soil saturated with filth that, you know, rather than contaminated water, that caused the disease. 
By then, however, it would be too late and the disease would be proliferating like wildfire through the British population of the city. The reprinting of various articles from the British medical press on the spread of cholera would continue through to September. On September 4th, the day that the first two cases of cholera were reported to have appeared in the Arnavutkoy neighborhood of Istanbul, the paper first attributed one of these articles to the insti instigation of a particular reader, Edward Dalzell Dixon, the chief physician at the British Embassy in Istanbul, and the British delegate to the Health Council of the Ottoman Empire and the Galata Board of Health. Born in Tripoli and educated at the University of Malta, Dixon was a Levantine who, sort of like Timoni more than 150 years earlier, was sort of somewhat ambiguously situated between Britain and the Ottoman lands. You know, his obituary, which was published in 1900, you know, noted that, you know, although he'd resided so long in the East, you know, he still retained an interest in English affairs. And even in his own practice, I mean, he was a member of British scientific institutions like the Epidemiological and Zoological Societies. But he also espoused a very, at that time, Mediterranean belief in the efficacy of quarantines and a strong conviction that microbial theory, even in its infancy, was correct. In a 2006 article by the historian of disease Sheldon Watts, described Dixon as one of the few physicians of the era who was, quote, 100% medically sound, and as someone who was prepared to confront directly medically incompetent uh, politicians who wielded immense power. Uh, properly speaking, he concluded, Dixon should be regarded as a British national hero with a long entry in the Dictionary of National Biography, somewhere alongside Joseph John Snow himself. I don't think we should necessarily put Dixon on quite such a pedestal. I mean, uh, Many of his remarks were also sort of tinged by a very, uh, a very Victorian sort of racism. But in this aspect, he was quite correct and he probably did uh, attempt to save many, many lives. In any case, however, it would not be long before the paper would turn against Dixon, declaring his beliefs a case of, quote, official absurdity and warning that he could face charges of, quote, false imprisonment for advocating the imposition of quarantines. Um, and so the Levant Herald, like, it, it tended to speak for the public through pu uh, publishing letters to the editor, mostly anonymous, sometimes with names attached, um, which is a policy that kind of put the newspaper at significant risk, uh, like legal risk, uh, but it was also kind of served to uh, substantiate its claims to speak for the public of the city. Um, and this is a kind of uh, habit of the Levant Herald, which is quite heavily criticized by other newspapers in the city, such as the French language La Turquie or the Turkish language Basiret. Um, and indeed, La Turquie, for instance, was considerably more supportive of Dixon and actually published full translations of his articles and his uh, letters. Um, but on September 12th, by contrast, the Levant Herald published a letter by Isabel Burton, the wife of Richard Burton, uh, directly opposed to Dixon's advice. Based on her experiences in India and Syria, Isabel Burden proposed that what was necessary was, in fact, quote, cleanliness in private houses, freeing the streets from garbage and dead animals, moderation in eating unripe fruit, and the use of castor oil. Uh, and she also recommended that kind of tincture of one ounce laudanum, one ounce charcoal, and one ounce brandy, which would be dispensed by the teaspoon every five minutes. And a later letter writer would say, you know, this cure is more likely to kill people than the disease. Um, but actually, this treatment actually is kind of a little interesting you know, parenthetical because um, it actually first been spread in the Ottoman Empire by the American missionary Cyrus Hamlin during the Crimean War and had been kind of incorporated into local practice by, as the Hamlin cholera mixture. And so here Isabel Burton is kind of recommending uh, this as something she learned in Syria back to the British, but it's actually coming full circle in a way. Um, but it was on September 14th, however, that the relative equanimity that had characterized the response to the outbreak finally broke. With 14 cases now suspected in the city, the Galata Board of Health voted to deny the presence of the disease and instead blamed the symptoms on an endemic and non-transmissible cholera nostris or cholerine. Doing so would allow the port to continue to issue clean bills of health and prevent the interruption of trade between Istanbul and the rest of the Mediterranean. And the, the mayor, the Sheikh Ramini of Istanbul, Ibrahim Haidar Effendi, instituted like a number of kind of minor precautions along the lines of just about Isabel Burden, such as banning the sale of unripe fruit and you know things like this. Yet the Galata Board of Health, 
uh, which you know Dixon was a leading member of, also voted to impose precautionary quarantine against some British workers at the Dolmabache Gas Works who were exhibiting symptoms of the disease. And so the Levant Herald kind of railed against these terms, arguing, arguing, quote, that these victims of sanitary science were being imprisoned and questioning why those who were not infected were still allowed to come and go through the area. And of course, if you believe that cholera is spread by water, you know, this sort of this sort of quarantine makes sense. But if you believe it's spread by air or touch, it doesn't. So whether at the instigation of the British embassy or of its own accord, the imposition of quarantine made the paper draw a line in the sand. It was clear that the Ottoman authorities had aligned themselves with the continental contagionists against British interests at that time. And as such, the paper went against its own previous reporting and proclaimed that cholera was caused by fetid soil rather than microbial contaminants. The paper argued that quarantine was nothing more than false imprisonment and threatened that while the other board members were safe from prosecution as foreign citizens, Dixon would be jointly liable should the case be taken up in consular court. As it wrote, quote, there is good precedent for affirming that the plea of his acting, having acted in an official capacity would not save him from damages. The choice presented to Dixon was clear, recant or face prosecution. On September 18th, he sent the paper, essentially a mea culpa, writing that he had had no part in that decision and agreeing with the paper that it was illogical to diagnose the workers of cholera nostris whilst quarantine, quarantining them in the exact place that was supposed to be endemic with the disease. And so by 1881, Dixon would be you know, out there explicitly arguing that cholera nostris did not exist, that the notion itself was absurd. But 10 years earlier, he sort of retreated in the face of these threats from the paper and remained silent as the Levant Herald then vigorously criticized the quarantine terms and actually incited the British residents of the city to ignore them. And the results uh, were not good. <laughs> the results were in a way catastrophic for the British community of Istanbul, particularly within the Haskoy neighborhood along the Golden Horn. As Istanbul's health authorities, including Dixon, imposed further quarantines on Haskoy and other districts of the city, the Levant Herald's inability to articulate a clear response to the outbreak had devastating consequences. Whereas the populations of other quarantine neighborhoods, and you can see on this map, such as Kasım Pasha or Aynal Çeşme, had to some extent followed the quarantine regulations, the British community of Haskoy instead turned to quack remedies like, quote, the injection of ammonia under the skin, resulting in disproportionate loss of life. As reported in the Levant Herald on October 19th, quote, the British residents in Haskoy have at last risen in half mutiny, yes, sorry, mutiny against the absurd and vexatious sanitary arrangements. And they did so by deliberately breaking through the police quarantine and camping out at the British embassy in Beolu. And so by the end of the month, the papers and statements had become so vociferous to the point of threatening embassy staff and calling for attacks on Ottoman doctors that it's claimed to kind of represent any sort of actual public were clearly ludicrous and were actually highly criticized as such by the rest of the Istanbul press. By this time, however, the outbreak of 1871 was already sort of beginning to dissipate. As the cholera finally disappeared from the city and that sense of imminent crisis faded, the Levant Herald ran a series of long articles from December 5th to 14th, proclaiming its own vindication and arguing that the high death rate among the British community of the city had in fact proved that quarantine was ineffective and tyrannical in practice. As I wrote, the experiences of the British government in India had entirely discredited the recommendations of the Constantinople Conference and had disproven established sanitary science regarding the effectiveness of quarantine. It also disproven that cholera had a contagious character except under very exceptional conditions. And yet the rapid and anticlimactic end of the outbreak had for Dixon actually only confirmed his own prior belief in the value of quarantines and the soundness of microbial theory. And so, you know, when similar outbreaks had occurred in India, for example, anti-contagionist colonial institutions were by and large able to enforce their preferred scientific paradigm and prevent competition from other nascent theories. What Sheldon Watts has termed the quote, colonial idolatry of fact over the possibilities of experimentation. And this doesn't mean that the, the, the text and the uh, treatises on cholera produced by uh, Anglo-Indian doctors were bad science necessarily, but that there was a certain limit to the amount of experimentation possible because so much depended on the notion of cholera as a kind of endemic uh, 
uh, sort of unsolvable issue of India. And he was maybe sort of reminded of uh, Franz Fanon's observation in A Dying Colonialism that colonial kind of medicine is a sort of structural impossibility for the practice of medicine as commonly understood requires a relationship of trust between doctor and patient and an agreement on a shared system of values, which a colonial situation itself makes sort of untenable. And we might say something sort of similar for epidemiology, you know, in, the, in an area where colonial rule is kind of bound up in a kind of sanitary consciousness and a sanitary civilizing mission. As in British India, as in French Algeria, epidemiological science is also sort of, you know, impossible to act as science as such. It kind of acts more as an ideology. And so in Ottoman Istanbul, however, neither the contagionists nor the anti-contagionists had hegemony. Dixon, you know, he, uh, by contrast, kind of had the support of a network of local and international institutions. And even though his position was a relatively, you know, minor minoritarian proposition, even in continental Europe, he was still able to kind of experiment and practice with the institution of quarantines. Uh, and, and practice with uh, seeing if things that would work with microbial theory, you know, actually played out in practice. And so, although the 1871 outbreak has ended up recorded in historiography as a non-event, it would actually be in 1881 that the consequences of this freedom to experiment were made clear. That year, it had become apparent that the British government in India and officials in Aden had more or less been kind of forging the clean bills of health needed for ships to leave cholera contaminated ports on the grounds that any observable symptoms were likely to result of cholerine rather than a contagious disease. And so in coordination with the Egyptian sanitary board, Dixon threatened to impose permanent quarantine on all ships traveling from Indian ports, you know, through his authority on the Istanbul, or on the Gaza Board of Health, uh, uh, in order to stop the spread of the disease, but of course, permanent quarantine on all ships traveling from India, you know, in conjunction with Egypt, would sort of throw the entire entire global economy into chaos, right? Um, and he threatened to do this unless the British government formally repudiated the notion of cholera nostra, so cholerine, and instituted real time reports on the incidence of cholera throughout India. He also kind of remarkably proposed that Ottoman doctors be stationed in Bombay and Aden. Uh, to ensure British compliance with these directives. So his experience in Istanbul had actually given Dixon, <clears throat> you know, the kind of boldness, not only to risk his career, but also to kind of, you know, go directly against his own employers and the most, you know, powerful institutions in the world. Ultimately, though, the standoff would be ended not by Dixon relenting, but by the British invasion of Egypt in July 1882. The following year, as cholera brought from Bombay via Aden, ravaged Egypt, Robert Koch would arrive in Alexandria to conduct post-mortems on the victims of the disease. And it was there that he would settle upon the small comma-shaped bacterium as the possible agent of cholera, and in the process, swing the pendulum of medical science decisively towards the microbial theory of disease. So I'm aware this has been kind of like a winding and sort of scattered presentation. You know, as I stated, this is more like a, an adjunct to my broader doctoral project albeit one that has kind of attained a great deal of relevance right now. Um, and it's remarkable that in almost a century and a half of medical research since the time of Koch, our primary defenses against the coronavirus remain the same as those I've discussed above, quarantines, hand washing, and now vaccination. And each of these developed not as the pure products of, you know, just European rational science, but as long entrenched practices with histories between Europe and the Islamic world. Equally remarkable are probably the responses to such treatment, treatments, which I've seen quite a lot of in the US. You know, the flouting of quarantines in the name of protecting the economy, distrust of vaccines as part of a sinister, godless plot, and even the injection of detergent, you know, as uh, the former president once advocated for. Uh, you know, in a more naive time, we might have called these reactions, you know, backward and medieval, but in fact, they are just as modern as the technologies they rail against. And cholera, too, speaks to a certain scientific irony. We have a somewhat effective vaccine, but it is largely unaffordable to those who need it. We know it's transmissible, but current WHO guidance generally recommends against the economic destruction caused by quarantines. Our treatment regimen for most non-critical cases of disease 
is actually after you know two centuries of the most drastic experimentation, more or less the same as the indigenous treatment regimen that prevailed in India before the 19th century, which is constant oral rehydration, the provision of bland but nutritious foods, and plenty of bed rest. And you know, these are ironies that sort of defy a narrative of linear progress or the conception of medical science as some sort of particular gift of European modernity. Rather, medical knowledge then and now is the result of global networks of knowledge production and often has the kind of cyclical character. Within these networks, Istanbul and Britain have been historically important and entangled nodes with crucial practices such as variolation developed in the interstices between. Likewise, even with internal debates, even within internal debates within the field of British medicine, the site of Istanbul has played a vital role in the overturning of established institutional paradigms. It is this more global conceptualization of scientific practice, I believe, that may get us beyond the narrow structures of epidemiological orientalism and allow us to think about the development of epidemiological knowledge in a more holistic and multifaceted manner. Uh, so that's where, that's that's uh, my presentation, and uh, thank you so much. And I'll be happy to take any questions. Well, thank you. That was that was absolutely fascinating. And look at your beautiful timekeeping. I can see a long <laughs> and successful academic career ahead of you. We can always tell. <laughs> so that's uh, from. So that's absolutely marvelous. This, uh, thank you. And, and obviously, you covered a, 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 a great deal of, of, of ground. Now, oh. You'll need, Craig, you'll need to mute Mary Jane's iPad. It's causing the most extraordinary distortion. Right, thank you. Uh, I, I, your marks, of course, uh, about the relationship between the things that you've talked about in the 19th century and today are extremely telling. And I'm, I'm sure you're aware that the, uh, that the, the, the Turkish immigrant in, in, in Germany who helped create the, the first virus was, in fact, Anna Levy himself. And so you get multiple layers of 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 of, um, of of prejudice because certain circles in Turkey um, try to avoid mentioning him because of his because of his inferior background. Uh, uh, of course, not everybody. So it it, it doesn't nevertheless um, bring all these things out into the open when you get such a, a major uh, a contrast going on on this on this global scale, which make it absolutely fascinating to follow. Um, anyway, um, I did want to 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 to, to ask you. Um, uh, um, a little bit um, uh, uh, about your work, but I also want to mention one more thing, which is you made the point about translating in the um, uh, uh, right at the beginning of your of, of your talk uh, when these things were, were were being pushed through to the Journal of the Royal Society. But but actually, translation was completely normal. I don't think uh, sometimes one can fit ordinary events into a wider uh, a vision of hierarchy and dominance when in fact one doesn't exist. Uh, so, for example, in the 17th century, uh, they they um, they went out of their way to trans to translate the the wonderful work of Leeuwenhoek, and indeed, in order to to learn Dutch, the secretary of the of the Royal Society, sorry, in order to do it, the secretary of the Royal Society actually sat down and learned Dutch, because they realised that this was quite remarkable work. When they realised it wasn't a hoax, they thought in the first place it might be a hoax, and so and so you get this very very early on uh, in the history of the Royal Society. Were were they supporting foreign scholars by translating their work? And uh, as I say, when we're in contexts where there's no question that they're being that they're being, as it were, um, um, pushed within some wider framework of, of, of Orientalism or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but um, the, the Levant Herald is obviously absolutely fascinating, and, and I wonder whether you wanted to say a bit more about it. Obviously, you studied the paper very, very closely. But but what did it, did it have? Other campaigns? How did it get such an extraordinary hegemonic role over the decisions of, of what was happening in the city? Uh, well, I think, well, as uh, well, I'll do the translation point first, and then the other one here. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, I agree with you completely. Translation in itself is not necessarily a sort of, you know, uh, necessarily reflects any kind of power imbalance for sure. And I think in the case of Timoni as well, I mean, he was translating from uh, sorry, Woodward was translating from Latin. So, uh, you know, again, this is a universal language, you know, so it's not necessarily by itself that being a kind of uh, you know, orients that sort of thing. Um, I think where the translation sort of aspect comes in is Woodward gives a kind of, you know, um, not just a translation, but a kind of introduction aspect to it, where he says, you know, 
he kind of vouches for Timoni and says, this guy, you know, uh, he, you know, he, it's kind of like the introduction, you know, uh, you gave for me, right? This guy, he did that stuff, he got his degree, you know, whatever, right? And so I don't think this is necessarily a, a, a sort of issue of power, but it is a kind of way of making someone familiar to this audience um, in a way which wouldn't, you know, exist. Uh, yeah, in a way which, which does sort of um, imply a kind of, you know, ambiguity to the original person. Um, yes, yes, you have to make the, 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 the strange familiar, of course, mm -hmm. uh, in some way. Um, that's the way that the Royal Society itself worked. Yeah, for sure. Um, for the Levant Herald, um, so I mean, as the kind of only like major English language paper um, in the city during that time, and, and as you know, during the 1870s, I believe uh, there's about 14 um, sort of like daily kind of newspapers in Istanbul at the time, maybe not daily, weekly sort of newspapers or mm -hmm. regularly published newspapers. Um, but Levon Herald is, you know, uh, posts both in English and French. It, it's every day. And, uh, because of that, you know, it sort of really has a kind of position in shaping journalistic norms in Istanbul during that time, alongside mm -hmm. Journal de Constantinople and, you know, but also as a kind of, um, paper, which is, introducing the language of the urban public and speaking for the public and, and things like this. Um, because something like, you know, Takvim and Vekai, right? It's an official newspaper. It gives events of the government, but it's not really claiming to speak for the public mm -hmm. of the city, right? Um, whereas the, the kind of tradition of, you know, English newspaper writing was this kind of public writing. Um, and so La Quick Turkey has that also to some extent but the, the difference between them is that, for instance, La Turki has a very strong editorial hand where it'll say, like, uh, you know, it'll criticize the mistakes of other publications and it tries to portray itself as kind of removed from events, as a kind of neutral arbiter of events. Whereas the Levant Herald, because it's so um, active in publishing letters and things like this, it really claims for itself you know, not as a kind of neutral arbiter, but as an advocate for the public. Um, mm -hmm. And so actually, you know, what happens is, you know, during the outbreak, um, you know, apparently someone had written like a really like, you know, just insulting letter to, um, you know, the, the Istanbul sanitary authorities. And, um, you know, the, the Edmund Whitaker, the editor said, you know, if, the English community of Hasquay puts all their names on this and says, this is a statement of the community, we'll publish it. But if it's just anonymous, you're making us publish it and putting our name to it, which is getting us in trouble, right? Um, and, and so there is a kind of need to both filter the paper's own opinions through the public voice, but also they gain that public voice through the attribution to specific people. And that's something that's pretty unique about the Levant Herald in Istanbul during that time. Um, you know, there's Ottoman newspapers like Basida that publish, you know, what are called city letters or Shahir Mektuplara, but these are personal observations by the editor in chief, right? They're not random people. So I think that's why the Levant Herald is very interesting. This is absolutely fascinating. It must have been more than that because I have studied the, the 19th century newspapers of Rome a little bit. And what you get there, they're basically aimed at the travelers coming through. They say, you know, it's, it's a jolly nice day today. Go and have a look at the forum. Go and, go and have a look and see, see, see where the, the emperor was doing this or something like that. Or the, it, it, it didn't become a political force um, in, 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 in the way that clearly the Levant, Levant Herald did. And I'm wondering whether it's, I'm wondering whether there's some link there to the capitulations mm. and somehow or other they had some links with the embassy that, 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 that gained the extra oomph. Um, and did you, did you get any sense of that at all? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they they definitely, particularly during Abdul Hamid, um, they had a very kind of complicated relationship with the British embassy and the Ottoman state. Because on one hand, mm. 
they really took advantage of the capitulations to, you know, kind of get out of legal trouble, get around censorship laws and things like that. On the other hand, one of Abdul Hamid II's policies was to kind of uh, subsidize, which is, you know, essentially bribe newspapers to write good things about them, uh, but the Ottoman government. So the Levant Herald, even though it was kind of semi-attached to the British embassy, also received these subsidies from the Ottoman government. Hmm. And so it kind of played a, a kind of very delicate balancing game between, you know, um, trying to use the capitulations to criticize, but also trying to gain as much as they could by tempering their criticism in certain ways. Hmm. Um, there's a very uh, good study of the Levant Herald by uh, Burhan Chavar. Uh, he wrote a recent book about it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Well, I shall, I, shall, I shall look out for it. Th thank you very much. Well, everybody, you're welcome to unmute yourselves and just kind of could jump in, um, or you can raise your hand if you, if, if you like. Um, Craig will spot you if you raise your hand, if you haven't just jumped in. Um, my particular login, I don't think, will allow me to see it. Ah, but I can see one. So, so James Bone, would you like to ask a question? Hello. Yes. Hello to everybody. Um, my question is slightly more sinister. <laughs> And it's based on um, really the amazing work of a professor called Paul Windling, who wrote about epidemics and genocide in Eastern Europe. And his basic thesis is that epidemics paved the way for genocide, that typhus, which he mostly writes about, was seen, well, was transported by the itinerant population and so Jews and gypsies particularly became identified with typhus and many of the things that we associate with the Holocaust um, even Zyklon B for instance which was originally a disinfectant gas developed for ports and ships um, were things that came out of this obsession with hygiene and epidemics and given the German role in Turkey um, during the First World War. I wonder whether there's any um, read across of that um, to what happened to the Kurds, the, sorry, the, to, the, to the Armenians, in the, the genocide of the Armenians. And I, just one other little point on your presentation, I noticed that that, that print you, you had of, the, of death riding the bowsprit of a ship, mm. a British ship with a, with a Turk, with an Ottoman cap on, seem to have been drawn by a German whose name was Friedrich Goetz. So I just wondered whether, you know, I'm interested in how much that kind of ideology of epidemics um, and identifying a victim population with the, with the uh, carriers, uh, whether there was any of that in that period leading up to the Armenian genocide. Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, I think this is probably like, you know, the kind of characteristic of all sort of genocidal discourse is that, you know, these people are vermin or disease or filth or whatever, right? And I think that that language of purity versus contamination um, really, I, I think it, it precedes genocide, but it structures it for sure. And I think I do agree in large part with, um, with the book you mentioned. Um, for my research, maybe I'm not sure exactly about the Armenian case, I mean, obviously, there's a kind of way in which disease, you know, was both, you know, sort of by neglect, but also sort of by active, you know, active non-interference, we might say, was basically allowed to kind of do the work of killing populations. Um, obviously, you know, that kind of paradigmatic case of that is Native Americans in the US. But we also see that, you know, really deployed at scale, I think, in, in the 19th century and the 20th century. Um, you know, I mean, there's a, when you read about like the orphanages for Armenians in, in the, during the war and you see that, you know, it was basically expected that a certain percentage of them would immediately die. You know, I think we, we kind of get the sense of how this disease actually operated, you know, aligned kind of with genocidal policy. Um, but even when it didn't end up being, you know, fully genocidal, 
uh, you know, again, maybe I can go back to actual my, my doctoral project is that, you know, there was never any situation, you know, any sort of genocidal discourse between the Ottomans and Iran, for instance. But the language of purity and contamination ends up, you know, really expressing itself in the cultural realm between, um, between these two uh, empires. So, you know, during this period, and particularly at the cholera conferences, um, in order to kind of cement their place within the European quarantine system, the Ottomans tended to say, you know, this disease comes from Iran, the plague comes from Iran, you know, it's endemic there, and, and we're actually the border of Europe, where we can stop it from entering. And there's all sorts of things about, you know, in Iraq, uh, Iranians tended to import corpses from Iran to Karbala and Najaf for like holy, for burials near the holy sites. And that became a kind of vector for disease and things. And so what you see gradually is that the language of purity, contamination, these kind of things actually gets expressed in the cultural realm between, you know, in Ottoman, you know, discourse about Iran, even in terms of things like language, which is very interesting. You know, they'll say, you know, this Iranian word, this Persian word, you know, is a, is a foreign element that's contaminating and affecting the language, right? And so it's very interesting to see how that actually connection develops, even when it's not expressed in terms of actual physical bodies or genocide or things like that. So in some ways, the contagion idea preceded the the, the idea that cholera was contagious, right? I mean, yeah, did it come sure. from other diseases? Yeah, I mean, cholera was sort of an odd one because, you know, because it, 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 it's transmitted by water, but, um, you know, it has certain, you know, clearly, you know, epidemic qualities, but also, you know, if you're just next to a cholera patient, you're not going to get cholera, right? It has to be some kind of ingestion of material and things. And so because of that, compared to something like smallpox, which was immediately understood as contagious, right? Uh, cholera and plague, and to some extent, yellow fever were some of the, the, the weird diseases where the people really had no idea whether these were, you well, know. Was typhus a problem in late 19th century uh, Ottoman Empire or not? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, yeah, both typhus and typhoid were, you know, very prevalent throughout. Um, I don't know if they were necessarily more prevalent than they were elsewhere. Um, uh, and again, I think this functions as a way of, as a means of discourse, because again, when I read Ottoman travelogues to Iran, they'll say, you know, there's no well more infected with typhoid than a well in Iran. But there's, you know, there's, but then again, as I said, uh, I believe as an American physician in 1908, we're saying every well in Turkey is contaminated by typhoid. So it's kind of a, you know, it's a, it's a rhetoric as well. Well, thank you. Any 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 more questions from the from the floor, please. I, um, I may please, I ask ahead. a question, Colin Riddler. Um, I thought it was a wonderful talk. Thank you very much. And yes, the parallels. I mean, the Orientalism uh, of the nineteenth century, of course, is translated right now into the Orientalism against really taking on board things like uh, masks and so forth uh, from Korea and Taiwan. But the question I wanted to ask is, is uh, from your reading, you were talking about variolation and the 18th century, 19th century, is there evidence within the Ottoman Empire for many Turkish writings from doctors and so forth? You've, been, you've talked about the sort of English the way the European texts or perspective, but uh, were Ottoman doctors writing or researching that we know of these diseases? Uh, we know of some things. I mean, we, we have medical texts which are still in the kind of sphere of like the humoral theory, but do talk about these diseases in the way that uh, certain treatments happen. I don't know. There's a book by uh, from the I think it's the only real like study of you know the the, the variolation it's like a complete study of variolation in Turkish, which is by Suhail Unver. It's pretty old though, um, but he does talk about um, 
you know the the the, the text we have about variolation. I don't know that we have like a full like medical treatise about variolation itself, but we do have like scattered references. And if you go to like, um, I remember I was in a deer name. There's like a you know a, a, a hospital museum there, and they have lots of like you know little mannequins and things. And they actually have like a, a, a whole thing about vaccination with mannequins and the tools, and you can see all the equipment that was available for it. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not sure how much of like a kind of full treatise we have. But was there a tradition within Ottoman medicine of publishing, uh, I mean, if not pr proper science papers, but uh, you know, discussing the pros and cons of different methods that you know of? Yeah, I mean, again, I guess I wouldn't really call it experimental medicine in that sense, because there are obviously very treat lots of, you know, again, medical treatises, um, but they're coming at things, you know, again, from the perspective of humoral theory and, and trying to oh. figure out ways of, you know, so there's disagreements, but they come happen on, I guess, on the logical level rather than the experimental level. Um, but variolation, I mean, this was a practice which was again mostly practiced by women right during this time um oh. and so because of that within these kind of medical texts you actually don't have that much you know of a kind of sort of uh theoretical understanding i guess of it which again is quite similar to the european uh cases during this time as well oh. in which they have descriptive but not theoretical oh. thank you <clears throat> Um, hi. Hi. Um, so uh, actually, the point about the um, uh, BioNTech uh, and uh, and the um, and the um, uh, quietness about the um, uh, the vaccine in Turkey, as opposed to there's a huge loud voices that how uh, this letter of Dr. Montague and how the Turks really contributed the discovery of vaccines in general to Europe. And as well as um, they're talking about the rabies, um, the, the Abdul Hamid's contribution to um, um, uh, Pasteur uh, uh, and uh, that the, the, the center afterwards was established in Turkey two years after, in, in Istanbul, two years after the uh, pastor found the uh, vaccine, etc., etc. They've been, they've been talking about these things quite loudly and they're very quiet about the BioNTech vaccine at the moment, which is very, very ironic, I found. Um, so, um, uh, uh, so it's interesting that, you know, uh, it's the kind of, as you gave examples of the US and, uh, and the um, ideologies there about it, it's, it's just exactly, there is the opposite here in Turkey. Yeah, for sure. And you know, like, you know, what I wanted to like talk about in the presentation was not like, you know, the kind of like nationalist, like, no, we invented this and we went to that. Like, yeah. you know, it's more about, you know, the, 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 it's the connection between places and the, you know, certain sites at certain times have this ability to produce things. Um, but yeah, I know for sure, like I'm from Canada and like all the time we say, no, actually a Canadian invented this and you know, <laughs> basketball is Canadian and that's Canadian, but you know. It <laughs> but they're uh, completely excited about Biontech, it's amazing. <laughs> Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. uh, any more questions from our... our um... I have an Iran related question for the end. I'm sure our speaker can talk about Iran as well. Get, but it's, a, it's, a, it's only a, a slightly long shot question about contemporary, uh, uh, current Turkish-Iran relations, um, whether he has any particular insights into the Halk Bank case and Zarab, the Iranian banker, who has struck a deal. And um, that, that, uh, that seems to be an enormous Achilles heel for Erdogan, that case. And they seem to have given an inordinate amount of effort lobbying Trump, and no doubt they'll try again now uh, to stop that case. I just wonder whether you have any particular thoughts about that. Uh, not so much. I mean, I don't focus too much on contemporary. You don't follow that now. I mean, I remember, you know, I think it was like 
I mean, I remember I think it was three years ago, four years ago, you know, one of my friends was telling me like, oh, you know, the Hulk podcast, that's going to be the thing that brings Erdogan down. And, you know, that, that, that didn't happen. So <laughs> I think, you, you know, it's possible that it's going to cause, you know, certain flunkies to go down, but I don't think it'll cause it, you know, he's gotten out of jams before, so. <laughs> any any other other questions? Well, maybe whilst you're whilst you're you're, you're thinking of your, your comments, I I thought your points about the the way international academic congresses function were were, were, were very apropos. I mean, it really is fascinating the way these nineteenth century congresses are dressed up as, as all of them as kind of little congresses of, uh, of Vienna or something like that. So you have the you have the, the the academic delegations, and then you have the official appointed delegation for that country. Who stands up and makes a florid speech, and it's, it's wonderful the way that they um, uh, they encounter all these maneuverings. But there is some logic in it because the underlying philosophy, so far as I can see, is that it's the it's it's it, it it's a place where people can meet to talk outside their immediate national interests. Mm -hmm. And the point is that once you're in that space, you can share ideas using a different kind of mentality. I suppose in the big congresses after after the Napoleonic War, it was diplomats can talk to each other, even if our politicians oh, hate sorry, each other. I, think I can't. Uh, I think I missed the part. Ah, I was saying in, in so after after a great war or something, when a congress comes together, the justification for the people meeting there and talking together uh, is that they they cross national boundaries. They're they're the diplomats, and diplomats can talk to each other, even if the uncivilized oiks are throwing stones at each other. And likewise with the academic congresses as well. The idea is very, very clearly that the it's the job of the politicians to, to lie for their country, to be nationalistic. But we as academics can meet our fellow academics uh, wherever they are in the world, and we can meet on this kind of neutral ground um, and 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 exchange ideas. And I, I think the idea behind it uh, is, is 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 a conception of shared knowledge. So that once we've shared our knowledge, we can go back and inform our respective masters. Uh, that this is a much better way of doing things, whatever the field of academic study is. I, I don't know whether you think that interpretation is uh, appropriate for the kind of things that you're looking at. I think so. I mean, you know, I, I think there's a there's a kind of, I guess you could call it like a kind of like a maybe paranoid reading of these kind of like international conferences by saying that actually this is shaped by exclusion, it's shaped by this, shaped by that, this is not international mm -hmm. at all, whatever, you know, which is fair for sure, um, but I think there's also a kind of more, um, I don't want to say optimistic, but a, a kind of reading on these things where these ideals of internationalism, even though they are structured by these issues, do have a real social power, right? And they do have a, a real effect in providing a kind of standard by which to measure against the failures of internationalism. And so yes. I think when we see, yeah. you know, the, the, and it's true again with science as well, right? I mean, it's when obviously we know that science is not just kind of, you know, objective, totally removed realm from politics and society, but because it sets that standard, we can judge it against that standard, right? And so it, 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 that, that ideal is not just a kind of, you know, ideological figment but does have a real structural power and i think yeah for sure definitely at these international conferences we see that in action and even in istanbul itself i mean if you look at the publications like the you know gazette medical orion they mm -hmm. they're yes we can say okay they're definitely structured by orientalism they're structured they, they they conceive of things in this terms but the project of thinking about you know a kind of universal fight against disease and the you know an international um you know coming together of medicine in this city uh it it, it had real effects right it, it, it was not purely a bad faith thing um and so yeah for sure yeah exa exactly exactly and funny enough even in the 20th century the french were 
were, were notorious for using these congresses as, 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 as kind of nationalistic exclusion zones yeah. as well, yeah. particularly the French. They wanted to keep the Germans out as much as they as they possibly possibly, <laughs> possibly could. Um, but um, also your point about shared spaces and circuits is a very interesting one, because, of course, that's exactly what happened with, with archaeology in the 20th century under the Republic. When, um, of course, it began a little bit before the Republic as well uh, under Hamdi Bay, but after that, there really was a boom, and people from all over the world um, um, congregating for about a hundred years and uh, in, in sharing an enormous amount of information, uh, very, very much as part of a shared, a, a shared uh, archaeological discourse, which really I don't think is is, is repeated anywhere. Um, yeah, uh, sure. Yes, yeah. Yes, yes, um, and I think please. you know again, like you know, like as of medicine, you know, and with archaeology, I mean, these things really function well in the situation where that power imbalance is not quite as present, right? So like, I'm always, you know, kind of, I, I mm. feel sort of like, you know, uh, like a little bit of like, I guess joy, I don't know, when, you know, you go through like a Ottoman art history book, for instance, you'll see this is in Suleimania, this is in Topkapa, this is in, right? In a sense that the the the, not pro, the projects of producing knowledge about the Ottoman Empire was, in a way, a shared endeavor from you know von Hammer's time up to you know the present. Whereas you know when you see the way that colonial anthropology works, you know it it's considerably more problematic. I mean, it's really problematic, right? <laughs> because that power imbalance was so structural to the functioning of that discipline that even the knowledge produced is not very useful right to our contemporary understandings um, whereas I do find that Ottoman studies you know and you know archaeology in Turkey again not these things aren't absent this power balance is not absent but we do see I think a, 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 a maybe kind of like a healthier discourse in a way um, yeah, the point you make is fascinating, but I wasn't sure. Not all anthropology is is no, I'm so. Not saying everything, so, but I mean, no. it, I mean, if you look at Westermark's work in North in North Africa, for example, the books he wrote on 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 um, on uh, 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 the local understanding of religion are, are still uh, fantastically useful today, um, and, and yet he was totally a benefit of the colonial enterprise. I mean, in the splintered situation in Morocco, he would. He would. Um, uh, uh, he found local Berbers, and he would play off the Russians against the French, and he would. He would um, um, do all, pull all sorts of strings to get them out of trouble when necessary. He ended up living in the in the Swedish uh, consul's house. So yes, totally. But but on the other hand, his, his writing is quite superb. But I do take I do, I, I do take your point. You need control of your own of your own uh, your own lands and your own state before you can before you can start even talking about things on uh, from a point of view of equality. Um, and unless you can establish that, then you can't do it. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I absolutely agree, I agree with you in, in, in entirely. And it does work with archaeology, and clearly it worked um, with medicine in, in, in a way that you outlined very, very well. Um, uh, but, but please, um, uh, questions, please, from colleagues. Uh, I don't know, uh, P Peter, what, any comments? Ah, there we are. Peter, please. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Your head is okay. occluded. Well, firstly, thank you for a very wide-ranging and stimulating talk. Uh, returning to Lady Mary Wortley Montague for a moment, um, what strikes me as being particularly remarkable is that did, she did succeed in getting the Queen to vaccinate her own children, and yet in spite of that, it didn't go very much further, and that really does seem a remarkable level of prejudice. Uh, have you any explanation for that? Uh... Well, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's kind of funny, like, the criticisms that, you know, she was, like, quote, not decisive, right? Because she was as decisive as she could be at that time, right? Like, you know, from her position as from, you know, going to the press, talking about these things, right? Um, you know, convincing, you know, in a very kind of strong kind of, like, public relations idea, right? Trying to find the most <laughs> famous person you can to test this, you know, theory out on. Um, yeah, I, I mean, the two issues, again, one was for sure prejudice, and one was that because people were expecting a certain thing out of 
you know, out of the practice of surgery, people kept adding on additional elements which were not necessary for the procedure and in fact made it much worse. And we might, you know, say the same thing. We're like, you know, if you go to, well, this happens a lot in the United States. If you go to a doctor, you want a prescription, right? You want something that is going to, you want like a bag of pills, right? Even when that situation doesn't even call for it. And I think there was a norm for surgery which says, okay, you need to fast for a week, you need to bleed for a week, you need to do this, and then you can do the surgery. But of course, variolation was actually hindered by all these things. You need a strong immune system, you need your, you know, a strong, uh, you know, you need to be well fed in order, you know, for you to fight off this weakened virus. Mm -hmm. And so, the practice of variolation actually lost a lot of its uh, you know, efficacy when it was practiced by many of these physicians in Europe. And that's why people like um, one of the physicians, Angelo Gotti, went to Istanbul in the 1740s and relearned the procedure again and then brought it back to Paris and was doing it the proper way and was a big sensation. After he died, again, people went back to you know, bleeding before and stuff. And so it wasn't until, you know, the, the late 18th century that, you know, with the Sutton brothers who kind of independently figured out the right way to do it, um, that variolation was actually a safe procedure again. And that's when, you know, Jenner uh, was able to, you know, yeah. move on to vaccination. It seems almost as though people couldn't accept that such a simple practice could be effective. Mm -hmm. They had to complicate it. Yeah, for sure. Uh, an, another question. Um, I know that uh, you referred to the inefficiency of the British military in the Crimean War, which is not hard to accept um, in more respects than one. <laughs> um, but there was one um, apparently highly efficient proposal which seems to have been realised on the part of Brunel, the engineer, who fitted out one of his great ships with a mobile hospital and collapsible beds, I believe, um, shipped it out. Uh, did that go to Uskodar or did it go to the Crimea itself? Do you know about that? Uh, I believe it went to Crimea, but I have to check. I'm not exactly sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, you know, again, like I don't want to be like, too unduly harsh about the inefficiencies of the, you know, the military during the early stages of the war, because it's the early stages of the war, you know, I mean, there's, there's any number of issues that happen. Um, but, you know, from the perspective of later historiography, you know, when we, when we see that many of the issues with Uskudar were avoidable issues, they were not intrinsic issues. I think that changes the way we have to conceive of Florence Nightingale's project. Yes, I mean the the the, the point about ideas surely is that they fit into an, an, a, a wider uh, context, and it's from that context that they have to be considered by the people who are receiving the idea because they've got no other way they can they can actually interpret it. No other screen that is their screen that they interpret ideas with, um, and and so um, ideas in themselves aren't enough. You need you need a wider infrastructure. Um, in order to implement things. And then gradually these collective uh, identities uh, uh, and administrative structures get in a position uh, where they can actually do something about it, which is sensible. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's not so much, I think, that, 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 that she was willfully ignored. Of course she was ignored, but it's rather that there was just no wider context with which they could implement the idea properly. Mm -hmm. uh, or rather, when they did try to implement it, they put it into that context which existed, uh, which, 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 which was simply wrong. Um, the extreme example, of course, is an apple falling off a tree. Um, you know, everybody knows about that, but unless you've got the wider, the wider collective scientific understanding of why that's significant, forget it. You know, I mean, so um, otherwise we could always cl we could claim that gravity was invented all over the world, couldn't we? Um, but uh, uh, more questions, please. From anybody who'd like to, to ask one for our speaker. You wouldn't like to talk a little bit about about the way that your the research you've just described fits into your wider understanding of Iran and Turkish relations. Are you looking at it through medical medical discourses? I am, yeah, looking at it through medical discourses, um, but also through um, it's a quite a 
kind of wide ranging uh, project, but it's also looking at it through literature as well and through language analysis um, right. and seeing, again, as I discussed, like how the language of hygiene kind of gets translated into the language of language hygiene, which is part of the Turkification process in the Ottoman Empire, but also part of the Iranification process um, of the Persian language, which happens mostly during Reza Shah. Um, yep. Uh, but yeah, so I'm focusing on quite like a wide range of both medical texts, but also literary texts. In the 19th century. Yeah, 19th and early 20th century. Yeah. Hmm. So it's a big project, but uh, I'm hoping it'll be interesting. Well, I'm sure it will. I think you're very brave to take to take that on. Um, uh, that will you be using Western literature at all, or will you only be using vernacular literature? Uh, it's mostly in Ottoman and in Persian, uh, but uh -huh. yeah, I mean, obviously, I have to you know use references to sure, English and French sure. sources for sure. sure. That's a question here from 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 Tim Wotherspoon. Please go ahead. But it's actually Peter. Uh, yes, oh, I was just going to ask. Uh, just going to ask the speaker. Um, is he conscious? I I have the impression that because so many Arabic, sorry, so many Persian words and Arabic words were expunged from Turkish back in 1920s when they were reforming the language, um, the extent to which he's noticed that there's some pride that younger people do seem to take in showing off using some of the old words. And it, it, I get quite warmed when I see that people, uh, you know, they like to look back to the parts of their language that have been stolen from them because there was a, a zeal by the, teal, the Turk Deal Kuramu to remove as much Persian and Arabic as they could. Uh, and some of it has stuck nonetheless. Yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, all the time, and, you know, in Besiktas and stuff, like, you know, I'd see people with shirts saying, like, Majora Pedest and stuff, like all these old words that are, you know, uh, it was like a, I think it was like a company that makes all these, like, cups and things that have old words uh, written on them. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm not like a, I guess you would say like a, a person who, who necessarily thinks that, you know, language can be rich or impoverished or things like this. I mean, languages adapt to whatever the context is necessary for them to, you know, to, to, do, to work with. Um, but, you know, my, my partner works on Istanbul's fountains. And there is, I think, a sense, a sort of broad sense, you know, of maybe nostalgia, but maybe curiosity, I think, about, you know, being able to read the inscriptions on the fountains, I think. Um, and so that's what kind of she studies as well. Um, and I think you see, you see that both, I think, emerging as part of, you know, the kind of uh, Islamic reevaluation, Islamic, uh, sorry, Islamist reevaluation re of, you know, the Abdul Hamid period and also generally the Ottoman period. But it's not solely in that respect, right? It's, it's also, um, I think, a kind of a, a more broad interest, I think, in, in, in finding these words and finding these inscriptions and actually being able to read the city in that way. Thank you. Any more questions for our, our, our speaker? Um, is there anything that you would like to, to, to add? To give you the closing word, Eric. Well, how would you like to <laughs> sum up? Uh, no, I just, I'd like to thank you guys for inviting me. I mean, this has been great. I really enjoyed this series. Uh, I, I was watching some of the previous ones on, on the website, so uh, I'm really excited to see how it develops. And uh, yeah, thank you again. Thank well, you. We, thank, wonderful. And we, great. And we look forward to reading a very, very fat tome in, 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 <laughs> in, in, uh, whenever it is that it comes out in a few years' time. That, that'll be great. Um, Greg, just before we say goodbye to everybody, do you want to announce next week's, uh, next ne the, the, confirm what the session is next time? Oh, have we lost Greg? Yeah. Greg? Hello. Ah, there you are. Good. Yeah, it, it, it's all on the website. Um, So, uh -huh. so let, let me just... Uh, uh, anyway, thank you. A fabulous presentation. Thank you so much.
So much to learn. <laughs> so little time, even in the days of COVID. <laughs> so 9th of March, the lecture is going to be Shipwreck History of the Theodosian Harbour, Istanbul, mm -hmm. Turkey, by Dr. Ufuk Kojabash. So something about marine archaeology and the rediscovery of a Byzantine port. Mm -hmm. Well, that sounds, that, 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 that sounds great. Well, there we are. So we just have to thank our speaker uh, greatly. I'm sorry that you're not with us and so we won't be able to invite you out to dinner. <laughs> uh, but maybe on one occasion in, in future, if we have that, uh, have that, have that pleasure. And I think just a round of applause for our, our speaker, please. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, and, absolutely. And good luck with your studies. And we'll say we'll say good night from Britain anyway, whatever time it is with 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 you. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Thanks. Take care. Right. Right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you so much. <laughs>